Support for this episode of Trifles is brought to you by the Baker Street Journal, the leading publication of Sherlockian scholarship since 1946. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, there were men that were dancing, creeping, and crooked. But there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? What's a tantalus? Or a gasogene? And what's the difference between a handsome cab and a four-wheeler? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 255, British Birds. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we look at the minutia in the Sherlock Holmes stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Wolder. And Bert, are you ready to peck at this subject with me? I'm ready to peck and my name isn't even Andy. Okay, that's a reference that's <laughs> lost on all non-BSI people, so <laughs> congratulations. Um, well, well, everyone should know the great Sherlockian Andrew Peck. That's, oh, well, he, he wrote one of the great chronologies. That's yeah. right, with Les Klinger. So there you go. Notable guy. Well, um, then let's get right to it. The show notes for this episode are available at iHose.co slash trifles255. You write that all in lowercase. That'll take you directly to SherlockHolmesPodcast.com to this episode's notes. And there you will find any links that we have as well as how to get in touch with us. If you'd like to email us, we are available at trifles at IHearOfSherlock.com. We are at IHearOfSherlock on all of the socials. And, of course, we have a Patreon. And, look, we want to make an announcement specifically about Patreon because we are planning something for the end of 2021, the end of Season 5. We have a special bonus episode in planning it is, well, we're not going to tell you exactly what the subject is, and it's not because we don't know what it is ourselves and we're just kind of uh, pitter-pattering around it here. It's because <laughs> we want to maintain a mystery about it. This is a show, after all, about the Sherlock Holmes stories. We can promise you uh, the episode does have something to do with Sherlock Holmes. It includes a special guest, and it will be available only to our Patreon supporters. So check the Patreon link on the show notes or on the homepage of SherlockHolmesPodcast.com to become a patron for as little as a dollar a month. We look forward to having you as a supporter. Well, it is the third week of the month in Season 5, and of course that means it is time for one of our special episodes. It's a series of episodes we've been doing the third week of every month on exotic animals. This is the penultimate episode in that series. <laughs> Not Did you to be just say penultimate? Penultimate. Oh, penultimate. Penultimate, oh, okay. yes. Not, not to be confused with... Uh, penitentiaries or penny whistles or penitentiality or anything like that. Or a, or a henny farthing. Oh, no, I'm, I'm not henny, but penny. I'm right, penny, so. henny, henny penny farthing. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of henny penny, we are talking about exotic birds in the canon. And look, there are plenty of regular birds in the Sherlock Holmes stories. We've talked about... Well, at least one species of them. We talked about cormorants back on episode 229 earlier this season. Yes. And, of course, the, the very first time we have evidence of Sherlock Holmes encountering birds in person is in the Glorious Scott when he was at university. He went off to uh, the Trevor household where there was wild duck hunting. 
There's no word whether Holmes himself was hunting, but that's his uh, first run-in with birds. I wouldn't necessarily call wild ducks exotic. <laughs> I mean, they're more exotic than domestic ducks. I would have had domesticated ducks, right? Um, but well, the- you know, the interesting thing there, too, is Holmes' iconic headgear, whether or not it was because he was in that shooting environment or because he was out shooting in his younger days where where he may have grown up uh, in that sort of environment where he acquired a fore and aft uh, brimmed hat or a deer stalker, which is typically worn by folks who are out hunting. That is true. And, and the aft, what is that? Does that protect you from the wind? Does it protect your scent from going downwind? What, what's the, what's the, as long as we're talking about birds, those are bills, right? And <laughs> so what, what, what does that, that rear bill do for the wearer? Well, I think there's, it, that's a very good question because the bill of a deer stalker, although on some models of deer stalker today, the brim can be quite or bill can be quite large. Um, it's, it's, it's a reduced or short, generally, typically a reduced or shorter brim or bill, similar to what's on a cricket cap, which doesn't really provide any help in terms of shielding your eyes from the sun or so on. But I think it provided probably two things. I mean, one is, um, minimal protection from the elements. In other words, if it was raining or misty, it probably helped keep the moisture off your eyes. And also um, convenience, because you didn't have to worry about, let's see, where's the front of this thing? <laughs> you know, you could just pick it up and put it on. <laughs> Maybe that's it for, for people oh, who are and springing also action. It, also, it covered your back. So if you were wearing a tweed coat and you put on your tweed deer stalker, you blended probably more easily into the scenery. Well, that's that's my question. Not not the front of the cap, but the rear. You know, what what purpose does that rear bill uh, do? And and you know, protecting the neck from uh, moisture, from wind, um, as you say, blending in, and, and perhaps it, it. You know, if one is stalking deer. Uh, the deer have sensitive uh, nostrils, and mm. uh, they they may pick up the scent of humans more easily if it's coming up out of the back of the neck. Oh, that's true, but it probably didn't work very well for that purpose because I imagine what the deer did was say, "Oh, Dave, I smell tweed." <laughs> <laughs> We better get out of here. Uh, there you go. Well, uh, let's let's get back to our uh, our deer, uh, not our deer, our bird subject. Our birds, here. our birds. Now we know that Holmes had some interest in British birds by virtue of the fact that when he came back from the hiatus and was disguised as the old bookseller when he encountered Doctor Watson. Uh, in addition to Catullus and Holy Wars, uh, and a few other volumes, he he had a copy of British Birds. And, uh, that can't be random. Oh, no, not at all. And although, you know, it is interesting because there are so many contradictions to the character of Sherlock Holmes. You know, in the cardboard box, Watson says appreciation of nature found no place among his many gifts. But we know from his commentary about roses, from his enthusiasm about the countryside and the lion's mane, and from many other instances that actually he was keenly aware, obviously, of nature. And he having that book, um, you know, suggests that it, its, its subject was not alien to him. And um, I'm sure it, it provided important information you know that was was welcome in his brain attic mm. well it's uh, in 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 our guide here uh a few hours to the birds a monograph on birds and birding in the time of sherlock holmes by don jewel he mentions that there's no book published in england before the adventure of the empty house which bore the title british birds alone it was A Natural History of British Birds from 1775 by William Hare, or A Synopsis of British Birds in 1789 by John Walcott, or A History of British Birds in 1837 by William McGillivray, or British hmm. Birds and Their Haunts, 1862 by C.A. Johns. Hmm. 
So um, could have been any one of those. And Watson, obviously, in his shorthand, just uh, made note of it. But it's interesting because Holmes' newfound interest of birds after the the great hiatus, right? He was he was away for three years, um, traveling across Europe and Asia. And when he came back, and we, we had tales of him in uh, The Solitary Cyclist, he and Watson were walking on a broad, sandy road, and they were, quote, inhaling the fresh morning air and rejoicing in the music of the birds. And then in Black Peter, also taking place in 1895, um, Holmes himself proposed that the pair devote a few hours to the birds and the flowers. How interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. And, well, and you know, and there are many references, too, to Holmes as looking like a strange bird himself, <laughs> which is, uh, you know. And then, of course, there are things that we're not going to go into because it's not unusual, you know, like the goose of the blue carbuncle and so on. Mm. But it is a constant theme here. You know, they're lunching on cold partridge in the veiled lodger and... Um, and other things, which is which is wonderful because it is such an important part of life, um, you know, across uh, across Great Britain. Yeah, it's a shame so many of the birds we encounter in the canon are on plates. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, let us plate this dish for you, and we will be back in just a moment with more mentions of rare and exotic birds. Hey, here's a quick question. Did you get a copy of the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual for 2020? Titled The Unique Hamlet, it was edited by Richard Sveum, and it concerned Vincent Sterrett's classic pastiche. Many people are asking about this, and the reviews are spectacular. The only thing is, you can't get a copy. Why? Well, the only way you can get a copy of the Baker Street Journal Christmas Annual every year is if you have an annual subscription. It's now 2021. Isn't it time that you took out a subscription to the Baker Street Journal? Not only will you get the four issues that arrive in the spring, summer, autumn, and winter, but you'll get that fifth Christmas Annual issue as well. Mm. It's the only way to get that particular issue with one single topic edited by some of the best Sherlockians in the world. Don't miss your opportunity to get a copy of the 2021 Christmas Annual from the Baker Street Journal at BakerStreetIrregulars.com today. All right, we are back, and we have a handful of birds that I think we'd like to cover here. I have at least three. Bert, you may have more, but I think let's start with these three. And we have a trivia question about an exotic bird in the canon that we will finish with, so stay tuned for that. So why don't we go with the most famous uh, odd bird in the canon, and I'm not referring to Sherlock Holmes. I'm referring, of course, to... The bird that Stapleton refers to in The Hound of the Baskervilles. What is that? Oh, that's wonderful. That's a, that is a great subject because, the, particularly because of the way Watson introduces it. Watson writes, I heard a long, low moan, indescribably sad, sweep over the moor. And I listened as it swelled into a deep roar and then sank back into a melancholy, throbbing murmur. And that's wonderful. And Stapleton says, uh, well, uh, d- did you ever hear a bittern booming? He says it's a very rare bird, particularly extinct, practically extinct in England now, but all things are possible upon the moor. And he says, I should not be surprised to learn that what we have heard is the cry of the last of the bitterns. Well, of course, this is this is misdirection on Stapleton's part. But um, well, th- because... Th- that, you know, yeah, go ahead. Well, because uh, in the book, British Birds' Nests by R. Kirton, we learn that the bittern had ceased to breed in England was, and was only a rare visitor to the island. And... Uh, there was a book in 1896, Lost and Vanishing Birds, 
in which the author said, I don't believe that the odd bitterns who ever vis- who still visited England regularly on migration would ever settle there again. And the reason for the birds' extinction, at least in the British Isles, was in the main, they believed anyway in 1896, due to the draining of the swamp, the bog, and the fens where it lived. And apparently it was delicious, which didn't, <laughs> which didn't, didn't, didn't help it either. And, uh, According to that author, Charles Dixon, in 1896, the last young bittern was captured there as late as 1886. Now, before we talk even more about the bittern, I've got a trivia question for you. Okay. This booming of the bittern. Yes. Do you you know of any bird, particularly an extinct bird in America, that also boomed? Boomed. Um, And do you know what that refers to, the booming? I do not, and I will say the dodo. Oh, well, I don't think so. I don't think that's true. Okay. But I do know that it is true because, you know, I'm, I greatly enjoy spending time in Martha's, Martha's Vineyard, and one of the birds that was native to that habitat was the heath hen. The heath hen. And if, okay. The heath hen, and if you Google Heath hen, you'll find it. It became extinct in 1932, and it's a very, very interesting bird, and I'll tell you why it's so interesting in a second. But the issue about booming is, and there's a huge sculpture. You know, one of the things I tend to do there is go bicycle riding, and in the uh, in one of the protected forests in Martha's Vineyard, there's a huge statue to the heath hen commemorating its demise. But what happens is the bird itself had... Um, you know, a very flexible pouch. Now, I'm sure our listeners, somewhere there's a, a or, ornithological listener who's about to look very, very negatively on everything I'm about to say because I'm completely <laughs> ignorant. But the bird had basically a very flexible pouch uh, below its uh, bill or cheek. And what it would do, it would fill that with air and then expel it, creating this ah, booming sound. Okay. And it was a way of attracting mates, of indicating, you know, power and things sure. like that. Interesting. And that's the heath hen. Now, the really interesting thing about the heath hen is since uh, we're in the 21st century and people are beavering around with genetics and recovering some of these extinct species, there's been work underway for several years, four or five years now, to bring the heath hen back huh. by uh, taking its genetic information or whatever. And, uh, well, I, I'm ill-equipped to, to okay. explain the, the process, but it is fascinating. It this is. This booming, this boom. And if they sound. do, I hope they bring it back to Martha's Vineyard, but please do not bring it to Nantucket where they don't tolerate heathens. <laughs> <laughs> the heathens yes the heathens have no place oh that. that's a homonym sorry about that well here's here's a question about about that misdirection of the bittern booming in the hound yeah. of the baskervilles we're never told for certain that that was the hound making that noise right i mean this that's is the true. the yes. assumption i mean it's a very kind of dramatic uh, scene there, and you figure, okay, that, that's what it must be. But it's just as possible that it may have been Stapleton's sister wife um, <laughs> crying out in in her in her despair. You know, um, who knows? Well, it swelled into a deep roar and then sank back into a melancholy, throbbing murmur. Eh? See, well, I mean, maybe. she, she yeah, was maybe. De- she was despaired. Well, I'll um, tell you the nice thing though about the bittern, according to Mister Dixon, Charles Dixon in eighteen ninety six, the bittern had a secretive lifestyle that made it a rarely seen bird. It lived among the reeds. And when there, it relied on camouflage, lifting its head and standing perfectly still to become one with its surroundings. Hmm. And when it had to go out in the open, it did so under the cover of darkness. It sounds, you know, sort of Dracula-like or Sherlock Holmes-like in its habits. Yeah. Oh. Well, uh, let's let's move on to another type of bird, the plover. This isn't, uh, it doesn't really make a huge appearance here, but it's egg is referred to um, in Watson's observation in uh, the Copper Beaches. He said that Violet Hunter's face was freckled like a plover's egg. Well, that's a good question. Now, how did Watson know what a plover's egg actually looked like? Was this a was this a common phrase? Was it 
a breakfast delicacy at the time? I mean, well, apparently it was a breakfast. A co- it was commonplace as part of breakfast. Um, in his book, A Few Hours to the Birds, Don Jules says, um, eggs of many different wild species were served for breakfast in, Victor- in Victorian England. And I guess they were something of a delicacy because they cost more than just domestic, domesticated chicken's eggs. Hmm. Uh, so the su- supposition is Watson had dined on plover's eggs recently and was able to recognize their characteristics in violet hunter's faith, but face. But also, says Don, maybe Watson collected bird's eggs when he was younger. Yeah, that could be. Mm. Could be well, and there there are a variety of plover of, of plovers and of their eggs. The golden plover nested on the ground in short grasses and heathers of uh, the moorland, and four pear shaped eggs were uh, that it, that it hatched at a time were yellowish stone or cream colored and were blotched and spotted with umber brown and blackish brown. Well, that's a fine mm. appearance for uh, Violet Smith. Uh, or Violet Hunter, rather. Uh, there's the uh, the lapwing, or the green plover. Uh, they had eggs that were dark olive green, blotched and spotted all over with blackish brown. And then the Kentish plover, which was becoming scarce at the time. Um, and it... Uh, and, oh, her, she, she probably had a face that resembled the egg of a ringed plover. It was... Uh, that was nested throughout the British Isles. Uh, where it could find a flat, sandy shoreline. And uh, there was really no nest, and it hatched four eggs at a time, pale bluff, cream, or stone-colored, and spotted with small dots of black, blackish-brown, and bluish-gray. <laughs> but that, that really brings to mind a, a very different violet hunter than uh, I had once thought. So, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. And then hmm. um, and the stormy petrel. This sounds like a bird that is on the shoreline somewhere. Where do we find a stormy petrel? Well, I don't, is there ever, I mean, Holmes describes him, I guess you must be referring to Holmes' description of himself, where he says, uh, I guess it's in the, the Rygate Squires, or the Rygate Puzzle. He says, I, basically, at some point, he says, I am the stormy petrel of crime. But I don't know that ah. we ever call out an actual, that nobody is- actually says, hey, look at that petrel over no. there. <laughs> Right, I mean, so it's just a descriptor, just like the plover, uh, just yeah. a descriptor. So yeah, but they are they are birds that alert sailors of approaching danger, and as you say, sometimes called the stormy petrel or the little petrel or the sea swallow. Um, the adult birds feed on small fish. If a bad storm threatens, they head inland. So they're a great they're a great indicator of the weather to, of, of, tr- of trouble coming. Yeah. Yeah, well, and that, that's an apt comparison for Holmes and crime. Great, sure. so let's get to that trivia question that I promised you, Bert. Where in the Sherlock Holmes stories do we find mention of a flamingo? <laughs> ah. <laughs> oh, we've, we've, we've talked about this before. If somebody would have told me that uh, the word flamingo was really in the canon, I would have said, well, you must be kidding. <laughs> um, but even though we've talked about it before, I don't remember where it is. It is in the sign of four. Um, they are, oh, they are that's up. right. It was on, was on the Sholto's lawn. It was a lawn ornament, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was pink. Yeah, that's that's what they left all over the lawn after they dug it up. They they put a flamingo every place they yeah, dug. Yeah, been here, been yeah. here. Yeah, keep. Yeah, that's tremendous. Go. That would be great. <laughs> um, no, uh, it is. Um, let's see. It it is after. Um, let's see. Uh, it was after the explanation. Um, uh, there's no great mystery in that, but you will know all about it soon enough. How sweet the morning air is. See how that one little cloud floats like a pink feather from some gigantic flamingo. (laughs) Now the red rim of the sun pushes itself over the London cloud bank. It shines on a good many folk, but on none, I dare bet, who are on a stranger errand than you and I. So that was uh, following the footsteps from, um, uh, from Pondicherry Lodge. 
So <laughs> when they were out in the first thing in the morning, they were catching that flamingo sun. <laughs> Very well, poetic. Well, I dare say that that mention of a flamingo is really just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You take my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Above all, avoid the moor. When, as the old parchment quaintly put it, the powers of evil are exalted.